Uh, good morning, everyone. I see some new faces. Uh, welcome, if you're new, uh, and I see some faces I haven't seen for a while. It's so good to be with you this morning. And for those uh, who are here each week, it's such a blessing to begin again on this path that we're on, uh, looking together at the story of everything. This is our approach as a church in this season, working as best as we can to get a grasp of what the whole story that the Bible tells is really about. And we began uh, three weeks ago now, uh, and the, the first sermon in this series we entitled Love is Everything, because at the very start of all things, the Bible teaches us, is the decision of God to love us. Even before the foundation of the world in Christ, God had decided to be for us altogether. Uh, we then went from there to the first chapter of Genesis, where we saw the story of God's creation of Adam and Eve in this world. And very simply, uh, we saw there that everything that has been made by this God is very good. And we, we stayed there uh, just a few weeks back. This idea that God has made everything good really shapes our understanding of ourselves and the world we find ourselves in. It also leads to a very sensible question, which is, if everything is very good, why is everything so bad? <laughs> And that led us to Genesis 3, where we saw the story uh, of, of the tree in the center of the garden, where Adam and Eve together go to that place where God said, don't go there. Don't be in the center. Don't take for yourselves the knowledge of good and evil. That's for me. When you take that, you'll die. We saw that the way the Bible describes the breakdown that we, we all of us know far too well is that at the center of that disaster was a breakdown in relationship between mankind and God. Uh, we might say when we're out of the right kind of relationship with God, everything falls apart. And that raises the next question, with, which is very simply, if that's the problem, if everything has fallen apart through this relationship, well, what is the solution? And that really is the story that the rest of the Bible unfolds. And if I may say it very simply at the start... If the problem was rooted in the breakdown of a relationship, the solution is a matter of the repairing of that relationship. And what we see in the scriptures, and this is what we're going to consider together today, is that God repairs this broken relationship with a promise. And it's a promise that holds everything together. And that's what we're going to look at together today. The promise of God's faithfulness, and listen now, this is remarkable, to one man... This is where it begins historically. In such a way that his promise to that one man will be a blessing to every man and woman. It's a remarkable way the, the scriptures depict God's solution. And we're going to look at the story where this promise is made clearly. Uh, before we do, I want you to try your best to get the setting in your mind. I want you to imagine not a church building or a cathedral or some holy religious looking place, but imagine rolling hills. Uh, beside a wilderness, and there's grazing herds on the hills. There are sheep, and there's a shepherd, and there's a conversation that takes place between God, the creator of everything, and this one shepherd, this herdsman. And it's recorded in the 12th chapter of Genesis. And when this man is encountered by the divine, his name is Abram. And this exchange is recorded in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. I want you to listen as I read it. Let's, let's listen to this word. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This one scene, these three verses are of tremendous importance to the way that the Bible addresses God's solution to the problem that affects this whole world. There is, in a very simple way, an exchange between the Creator and this one man, and at the center of it is a divine command and promise, which amounts to the initiation of a new relationship between God and this man and in him all people. 
And before we get into the details, which we will certainly do, I want you to take a step back and look with me at what we're seeing here. In the broadest possible sense, what we have here, think about it, is God speaking to a man. The story begins very abruptly. Now the Lord said to Abram, I want you to use your imagination for a moment. What do you picture when you imagine God speaking to a person? I always pictured when I was young a, a man with a, a long white beard in the clouds hovering over uh, some kind of majestic looking cathedral surrounded by chubby little angels with harps and like religious men in robes looking up in awe. Anyone else have that kind of image? I think it came for me through Monty Python, which my parents watched. <laughs> Do you know those images? That's how I always saw God and imagined it. But listen now, you must do your best to take that out of your mind for a moment. And of course, I've really made it hard for you since I put it into your mind. But get it out of your mind for a moment and, and picture, instead of a cathedral and a temple and a holy man, a herdsman, an ordinary man leaning up against a tree at the end of a very long day of working with the animals. This isn't a man who's gone looking for God. It's not someone who said, I'm going to become more holy so I become a part of God's solution to the world. It's just a shepherd who's resting. And there are the hills and behind him the forest. He lives in a place called Haran. This is in northern Mesopotamia, current day Syria. That's where he lived. And as the sound of his herds are quieting, the sun is setting, the stars are blazing overhead, and as far as you can see, there are the heavens. And as he sits there, uh, there at the end of this day resting, suddenly the dark is split by a blazing light. There's something like a ball of flame, maybe, or some kind of fire, and out of that conflagration comes the voice of the divine saying, Abram, speaking his name, it's very different than an old grandfather in the clouds, isn't it? Now, it doesn't say here what it looked like, but if our imaginations are shaped by the Bible, we would picture something more like that than the white beard. And, and you, some of you know why. Do you remember how God appeared to Moses? It was in a bush that burned, and out of those flames, the voice came. Or when the people were led out of Egypt and God guided them through the desert. Do you recall how God's presence was manifest to lead them? It was a pillar of fire. Uh, and maybe some of you know on into the New Testament where the disciples, those first disciples, the Holy Spirit descends upon them. God's presence is visibly there on them. Do you remember the form it takes? It's a flame. So picture this conversation here between God and this man. The night is interrupted by flames burning in the dark. And a voice comes from those flames and speaks to this man a word of challenge and a promise that goes along with it. The initiation of a new relationship that had not existed that this man was not looking for. A superior power has come to this inferior man and initiated a new kind of interaction between the two of them, a relationship. Now listen, do you remember what the cause of the problem has been, according to the scriptures. It's a broken relationship, right? With Adam and Eve breaking themselves off from God. Here is God initiating a new relationship. And I want you to hear this. I'm going to unfold how. But listen, this relationship is the beginning of God's solution. A relationship between this superior and this inferior man. And the form that it takes which starts here and it becomes more clear as we go along, would have been known to the people in antiquity as a relationship called a covenant. Have you heard that word? If you've been around a church for a bit, you've probably heard that. If not, maybe it's a new word. But covenant is a style of relationship that has its roots in the ancient Near East. And for us, it might be a new concept, even if we've been in church for a long time. But for the first listeners to these stories, they would have known what a covenant was because they lived covenants. They knew that it was the kind of formal relationship that is initiated and sets terms right now in the present in order to determine the future. And in the ancient Near East, it was the most binding contract a person could enter into. I think of when you have to sign all those papers when you get a mortgage. 
That's like a covenant, right? And if you, it's got all the terms, and you probably didn't read it because there's too many pages, right? There's not that many pages in the ancient environment, but still, it's the same kind of thing. A binding contract that is meant in the present to seal something for the future, and that's what's happening here between God and this man. I'm going to give you a little background, okay? Fair enough? If it's unfair, get over it. <laughs> Here's the background. There are two different kinds of covenants in the ancient Near East. Covenants of parity and covenants of disparity. Parity are covenants or, or, or agreements that exist between peers, people who are friends, or neighboring villages. They might say, let's make an alliance for a good purpose, and they drop the terms of it, and they're both on the hook if it gets broken equally because they're equal partners. Then there are the covenants of disparity. This is where one party in the agreement is superior to the other. Okay, Think conquering kingdom overtaking a small village, and they strike up a deal with the villagers that's beneficial to the kingdom and allows them to continue existing instead of being obliterated. Covenant of disparity, the terms are drawn up by the superior. If the covenant is broken, the superior gets to decide what happens to the one who is inferior, and the terms, well, they usually favor, guess who? The superior party. And, of course, the quality of the whole thing depends upon the nature and intentions of the superior power. If the king is good and kind, then it will be good for the, the inferior. If the king is cruel and awful, well, who knows what will happen. Probably won't be good. With that background in mind, think now of this interaction initiated by God, who's clearly the superior, where he comes and he speaks to this man, starting this relationship. And what he does is he puts demands on this man, which always happens in a covenant, and he makes promises as well. Would you look with me now? Let's look at the details. In verse 1, we have the very simple demand that's put on Abram. Go. Has anyone here ever moved? It's a big deal, right? And when you move, you make sure you have a place to land. You, you make sure you get the lease signed or the house is ready for you. In this case... God comes to Abram and says, go from the land that you live in, where your family is, where your people are and your kindred, where your work is, where that comfortable tree is that you love to lean on. Leave that all behind and you go to the land that I will show you, which means go right now without knowing where you're going to land. Think of that. It'll take something for him to do it, right? Trust. Either he'll have to trust or he'll have to be terrified of not listening to the ball of fire or whatever it is, right? You can imagine for, for, for the, the force of this superior coming to him, this is a challenge that he knows he must trust if he's going to do it. And so God comes and initiates the relationship with that demand, and with the demand comes promises. And you'll see them, if you look with me back at the text again, in verse 2, there is what really amounts to the, the sum of the entire promise that God gives. It's got two sides. I will bless you, so that you will be a blessing. The first half of that is God's promise to Abram, what he's going to do for Abram. I'm going to bless you. The other side is what God's going to do through Abram. I will bless others through you. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. Here we see what this covenant partner means to do for and through Abram. The, the things he's going to do for Abram are very particular. The promise has sort of three components. He's going to give him land in verse 1. Go to the land that I will show you. God's promising to give this man land. And in the ancient environment, to own land means to have power. It's not easy to be a landowner back then. That's the first part of the promise. In verse 2, the second part of the promise comes through as well. Descendants. Uh, incidentally, at this point in his life, Abram is very old. And so is his wife. And they have no kids. And that means he, he does not have a hopeful future for descendants, but God promises to give him descendants. And then there's the third part of the promise. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. What does that mean? Think of it for a moment. It's the promise of divine protection. When you leave, and you have to go into the unknown, and you have to acquire this land, which will be hard to get, and when you have to still trust me to give you what you need to make this promise true. When all of that happens, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. It means I have your back this whole time. That's the divine promise. And the reason for it all, and this is absolutely central to the way the Bible answers the question of what is the solution to the problem. 
It all comes down to this statement which is reiterated again at the end of uh, verse 3. It's right here. I'm going to bless you so that in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. You see that phrase there? In a sense, that's almost... Uh, a, a, a summary of the solution that God is going to bring about for the entire world. If you think back to last week, if you were here, in Adam, in the man who turned away from God, all of the families of the earth were cursed. It says this very plainly in Romans 5. If you're a person who likes to look things up, take notes here. Read Romans chapter 5 and you'll see that Paul says, in Adam, all the families of the earth were cursed And now God's saying to this man, Abram, you are going to have this covenant relationship with me, and because of that, in you and your descendants, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Uh, By the way, that phrase, all the families of the earth, that includes every person in here. That includes your neighbors. It includes the family member who you invited to church but doesn't want to come because they don't like church. It includes your enemy your coworker and your boss, maybe all three of those are the same. <laughs> it includes every person that you or I will ever cross paths with. In this interchange between this divine fire in the night and this ordinary shepherd, there is already a promise that is about all of us. That God is going to do something in and with this man that will solve the problem. In which all of the families of the earth, you too, right here today, you will be blessed. It's a remarkable claim, and it, raises, it makes us raise good questions if we're thinking carefully. Here's a question. You ready? If God, this is a big picture question, if God wants the whole problem fixed, and God is powerful enough to create the worlds with a word, why doesn't he just say the word and fix the problem? Have you ever thought of that? Why wouldn't he just fix it? I know some of you have thought of this because four of you asked me this very question last week. And it is a very good question. Sometimes those kinds of questions are asked with motives that make it impossible to answer them. What I mean is one friend asked me because he thinks he knows better than God. I wouldn't do it that way. He actually said this. I almost fell off my chair. I wouldn't do it that way. That... If the question, why would God do it that way, is really a statement, since I wouldn't do it that way, I won't believe in God. That person needs to ask this question. Am I in the position to judge the goodness of God's decision? Am I that powerful and almighty and omniscient? Probably not. But the other way to ask that question is a sincere way, which I hope some of you are asking. Look, I really want to understand God. Why wouldn't God just solve the problem on his own? Why wouldn't he fix it himself? If something's broken and he could fix it, why not do it by himself? I'm going to give you a very good answer right now. Because the the difference for Abram and every other person in God's decision not to do it without Abram, but to do it through him, is impossible to measure how good it is. I'm going to give you this illustration. I, I saw that confused you. Let me clarify. When I was in high school our house was going to be rebuilt. And so my father hired an architect to design it, and then he paid the contractor to do it, and the contractor disappeared. And so now we have plans, but the house isn't going to be fixed. And so my dad decides, because he can do this kind of thing, to fix it, but he chooses to enlist the help of my brother and me. (laughs) And we're teenagers, and he didn't need to do this. He could have fixed it on his own. You can't imagine what it felt like to be a high school boy whose father said, I want your help. I'm building the house that we are going to live in. The dignity that that act on my father's part imparted into me, I'm sure that has something to do with my confidence nowadays, even if that confidence was misplaced because I didn't really know how to build a house. (laughs) Not only that, but it changed my relationship with my father to know that here, this man who's capable would choose to invite me. I, can, you, can you imagine? And here's another thing. My relationship with my brother who was invited in to help was also transformed. Because now he is not just my brother who I fuss with sometimes, but my coworker who I have a task to labor at Side by side, and maybe it didn't look like this because we were at each other, I don't know. But 
But still, even that, it changed my relationship with my brother. And, and then the last thing is my house became something different for me now every time I lived in it. And some of you in here have built your own houses, right? It's different, isn't it? When you fix something that is broken and you're invited in to do it, and some of you helped me fix my own house, it's different, right? A shepherd is invited by the creator of the entire universe to become a part of the solution to the problem. Not because the creator can't do it without him. Of course, God can do whatever he wants. But because there is wisdom in the design of God's mind that is beyond what we could imagine. And so he invites this man. Can you imagine the dignity of this shepherd to think? The one who put the stars in the heavens, which I sleep under every night, wants me to have a hand in his solution to this mess. And then, that not only makes Abram feel more dignity in his own self, but when he thinks about his relationship with God, now God is not just some abstract force out there in the universe operating at random upon him, but with him. And of course, that changes Abram's relationship with the others that he interacts with because now they become not people to be in competition with, but co-workers who are at a good task together. And then the whole world becomes different because God has invited Abram to be a part of the solution. You see the wisdom of God? I want you to understand this. The story that the Bible tells about everything is not just a story about other people a long time ago, but a story about us too. And the way God means to operate now even is to invite you into his renovation of this world, his restoration, as you are invited into the covenant as well. How do you become a part of this covenant? Faith. That means trusting God. We see it in Abram in that he gets up and he leaves his land behind. That's faith. Now you and I are invited through faith in Christ. And now we're jumping ahead. The story goes there. I'm going to take us there for a minute. Through faith in Christ to be included in this covenant relationship, this very formal and special relationship that God started with Abram and means to include all of us in so that we become the people who with him are ones who stop asking all the time, why is everything so bad? And start asking, how are we going to be a part of setting things right with this God who is all powerful, this fire in the night, who comes and says, I want you to work with me. If you would become an active part of this church, any one of you, you are saying, I will be a part of this covenant and be at work with these people in this place to bring about God's solution. And now I wonder if anyone, when they hear that, thinks, gosh, this sounds like we're putting an awful lot on an ordinary shepherd. Is God right to risk all of this? Is that wise? Like my father must have asked at least once, is it a good idea to have my sons up on the roof? <laughs> it's a risk, right? And it raises the question, well, what happens if we don't keep up our side of the bargain? Because a covenant is a really serious thing in the ancient Near East. It's not a throwaway. This is a serious contract. And Abram... That's, I think, one of the reasons he leaves his homeland, because he knows if, if God comes and says, this is what's going to happen, he's the superior, and I'm going. And along the way, a lot of years pass, and Abram is not seeing the fulfillment of the promises. If you know his story well, you know this. You can read it on your own from Genesis 12 and following. But he gets older, and there's still no kids. And he's, every, foot he, every footstep he takes, he's on someone else's property. Because he doesn't own land. And he can't just go to the Canaanites and say, oh, excuse me, God said I can have this land, so would you leave? Like, that's not how it works. And so he starts to wonder, is this actually going to happen? Have you ever wondered that? If you are a Christian and you've been at work following God, have you ever wondered, you know, when are these promises going to feel like real? Have you ever had that thought? When is it going to happen? It was many years for Abram. And, and a few times over those years, God comes again and reiterates his promise. God says, look at the dust of the earth. That's how many kids you're going to have. Another time he says, look in the, star, in the heavens. That many stars, that's how many descendants. He keeps making these promises. Finally, in chapter 15, Abram says, hold on a minute. How is it going to work? I don't have kids and we're still old. How do I know there's going to be land? In effect, he is saying to God, would you please give me something more concrete than just your word to go on to know that your promise of solving this whole mess through me and my descendants is trustworthy. What can you show to make me know that it's really going to happen? 
After that question in Genesis 15, here's how God replies. Watch this. This will sound strange at first, but stay with me. Verse 15, uh, 9 in chapter 15. God said to him, bring me a heifer three years old. That's a cow. I think. Is that right? Is it a cow? Why don't they just write cow? <laughs> a female goat three years old. A ram three years old. A turtle dove and a young pigeon. Listen now, this sounds strange to us. Uh, after this exchange, God says, all right, it's time for you to go get livestock and bring it here. It was not strange to Abram. He immediately knew what he was supposed to do. Look at verse 10. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. This is so strange to us. It would not have been strange to him, apparently. He knew that to bring the animals near was to ratify the covenant. That's a technical way of saying it's time to make the agreement that started all those years ago as official as possible. And so Abram grabs these animals and he butchers them. And he lays one half here and the other half here. And this is odd, I know. This seems so strange to us. But to Abram, this would have been well known because, as you remember, covenants were familiar contracts in his environment. And he knew that when there is a covenant of disparity, when there's a supreme power and an inferior, and the covenant is made official, there is a ceremony that happens that is dramatic and powerful in order to express the consequences if the promises are not kept. And the consequences involve the slaughter of animals. Let me give you a historical picture of this to make it even more concrete. These tablets, these tablets detail one such covenant ceremony. They were found about 120 years ago by a man named Leonard William King an English archaeologist who specialized in ancient Assyrian culture and can translate what is cuneiform writing. Has anyone here ever heard of the Code of Hammurabi? You know this phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? It actually comes from that, and the man who translated that into English is Leonard William King. He also translated these tablets. And these were found, this right here is an actual physical picture of the same kind of covenant contract that would have happened around Abram's time. This one is between a conquering king, his name is Asher Nirari V, and the head of the village that was conquered, his name is Mati Ilu. And it very simply explains to the, the inferior what happens if the covenant is broken. And it's filled with vivid language and threats. Listen to this. It says up there, now follow along please, up there. It says, this is what happens, ready? May Mati Ilu's land be reduced to a wasteland. May only an area the size of a brick be left for him and all his family to stand upon. May him, may he, together with all the people of his land, be crushed like gypsum. This is ancient smack talk. <laughs> it goes on to describe the same ceremony that we see in Genesis 15. A spring lamb is to be brought forward. Not for ordinary rituals of sacrifice, not for a meal, but to ratify this covenant, to make the promise concrete. Here's what it says up there. This spring lamb has been brought to conclude the treaty of Ashurnarari V, king of Assyria, with Mati'ilu. If Mati'ilu should sin against this treaty, that means if he breaks the terms of the covenant, so may, just as the head of the spring lamb is cut off and its knuckle placed in its mouth, so shall the head of Mati Ilu be cut off. This shoulder is not the shoulder of the spring lamb. It is the shoulder of Mati Ilu. It is the shoulder of his sons. It is the shoulder of his daughters and his magnates and the people of his land. The covenant is ratified with this slaughter and tearing apart of this animal, one side here and the other side here, to graphically show to Mati'ilu what will happen to him if the covenant is not kept. And in order to make it as dramatic as possible, while these terms are read, 
The man Mati'ilu must walk in between the parts of the animal that are spread out on either side so that he cannot forget what will happen if he doesn't keep his side of the bargain. Can you imagine that? How powerful the contract would be. Think of Abram again. The fire in the night has come to him and said, I promise that I'm going to keep my side. And he wonders aloud, what, well, what happens if it's not kept? And then the divine voice says, go get animals. And he has to butcher them himself. And as he cuts them, laying them on one side and the other, can you imagine what's in his mind? He has to wait now for the divine voice to say, now you walk through. That's what I imagine he's thinking. And in that restive state, he has to chase away the birds of prey that are coming upon the animals as he butchers them. It must have taken a long time. We hear this read in just a few seconds, but to take an animal to pieces and spread, that's hard work. Can you imagine what it would have been like? Uh, he works late into the afternoon. The sun begins to set, and we read in what comes next that he begins to fall asleep. He, he drifts off in sleep. Let's come back to, to uh, chapter 15. As he rests and sleeps, he has another vision of God's promises. They come to him. And again, the promise comes and says, you are to follow me and I will be faithful. I will give you what I've said. And then he arises in the night. And I want you to see in verse 17 what happens. As Abram is anticipating having to walk this path himself, look at what verse 17 says. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Do you see what I see? Do you see what this superior power is saying to this inferior man? Do you see what the creator of the heavens and earth is saying to this one ordinary herdsman who has been invited against all the odds to take part in the divine solution? Do you see what he's saying to him? He is saying, I know. I know it won't be two days before you fail. I know the risks that I'm taking in inviting you to be a part of this solution. I have good reasons for doing so. But what you don't understand yet is how deeply committed I am to the promises that I made, not just to you, but through you for the rest of the world. This is God saying, I promise. I promise to make things right, even though I know that to do so, I will have to be the one who ends up like these animals here. <laughs> this is the promise that holds everything together. And when you think of it, it's, it's astounding that God would do such a thing. To say so definitely that when this covenant is broken, and I know it will be, I'll be the one who suffers the consequences for you. And there's one reason why God does this. It's just one single reason. And the reason that God does this is that God has decided to be the one of whom it is appropriately said, God is love. That's why. That's the whole story. That's why we can sing, Though sore our sins and great our woes, his grace much more aboundeth. His helping love no limit knows. My utmost need it soundeth. My shepherd, and isn't it amazing that God becomes in Christ the good shepherd. My shepherd, good and true is he, who will at last his Israel free. That's all of us from all their sins and sorrows. Can you tell I like this? <laughs> Sometimes my daughter Lily asks me, Dad, why are you crying? And most of the time the answer is because I'm so joyful. Listen to Isaiah 
This is the word of the Lord. For the mountains may depart, and the hills may be removed. And that's a poetic way of saying, everything can fall apart. But, and this is a very good but, my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed. If we break it, it still won't be removed because God will not let it be so. Thus says the Lord who has compassion on you. One final word, and this will count for those who heard the first sermon in this series, the sermon about the Good Samaritan. Do you remember what it was that moved him to help the broken man on the road? It was compassion. God is the one who has compassion. Thank God. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for choosing to be the one who has compassion, for deciding in your own wisdom not to fix this mess without us, but instead to enlist our participation. We thank you that at the heart of your plan is a promise which holds everything together, and we thank you that in faith we are invited to take part in that promise. I ask now in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, that every person in here would see his part, her part, in, in bringing about the restoration and the redemption of the world with you as a person invited into this great solution. God, may we trust ourselves into your hands. May we, as Abraham did, say yes to every one of your calls. And then may you use us as individuals and as a church, and may Park Church itself be a church that is known as a church that trusts you and therefore serves you in the world, taking part in your renewal of all things. I ask that you would do this in and through us, that you would bless us so that we may be a blessing. And we thank you, lastly, for Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb who has laid down his life so that the covenant may be fulfilled. In his name we thank you. And all God's people said, Amen.